And now that we're just a few moments after the hour, I'm happy to get us started with a brief intro to Celesto and our webinar series. So thank you and good morning. My name is Alex Krusel, CEO and founder of Telesto Strategy. We're truly delighted to have everyone here with us today for a critical global topic where we're going to be continuing a conversation that started many months ago around connecting climate capital. Um, this is not a first conversation. This is certainly not a last, and we're all eager to have your participation. Um, although this is going to be recorded and shared, the point of this is to be as participatory and inclusive as possible. So we encourage everyone who's on the call today to really bring their questions forward. We have been collecting questions ahead of this webinar event um, that is directed at our guests. And again, we ask for everyone's participation as much as possible. Throughout this entire series, we're looking at availing global thought leaders, um, people who may not be accessible day in and day out to answer your hardest questions. So with that, I'm happy to kick off and provide a brief intro about our series and about Telesto. So let's go ahead and get started. One of the things that I already mentioned is today is not a one-off conversation. And this is not marketing. This is a programmatic effort to really connect the dots in this constellation of climate capital. Um, we've been working side by side with a number of partners over many months. And we wanted to highlight just a few of those milestones for us. We first got together with the US State Department, high tech leaders around the question of climate capital last year in August. And there was an express need of how we bring the right decision makers into the room together to really think about how do we better activate climate capital, both in the origination and the efficiency of climate capital, and then how do we connect it to destinations where we can demonstrate clear and compelling impact towards climate positive growth. Uh, thereafter, Telesto hosted an official side event at the margins of the US Africa Leader Summit, um, which was hosted by the White House. And there we brought together about 110 leaders some of them on the call with us today, um, who again provided that global thought leading perspective. What are those challenges? What are the opportunities? And what are the palpable solutions towards solving for some of these very difficult questions? Um, just a week ago, in fact, we carried this conversation forward in Accra. Um, we were together in Ghana to again determine what are some of these opportunities and obstacles? And what does it look like when you're on the ground? Less so at a macro level, Pan-African or, or global level, um, what does it look like in the context of Ghana? So Telesto parted as part of a delegation and we were amongst 20 or 30 other delegates and we also hosted this question and we'll be sharing a readout and summary from that, from that convening early next week. And so that brings us to today. Again, it's meant to be a dialogue, a conversation, um, a meeting of the minds where again, we avail world experts to come with us and provide things that are solution and action oriented. And we will also be sharing as we sort of again choreograph these other convenings, um, we'll be sharing those with all of you who might be interested in joining us in person. So that's in terms of how this is building. Again, it just to show this is not a one off conversation. This is not a blip on our radar. This is an enduring commitment. For those of you who haven't had the opportunity to work with Telesto, uh, very quickly, you know, we can go over some, a brief sort of uh, overview of who we are and what we're doing. As we think about climate capital, um, what has really come across over the past 12 months is, although we're seeing an abundance of inflows, you know, we're seeing so much climate capital come into the marketplace, um, we're also seeing that those who are looking for climate capital are unable to actually really achieve it and find those find those new flows. So to that effect, we believe we can be that connective tissue along this continuum, that we can really bring this ecosystem together. Um, there's a number of things in which we can help with that regard, um, you know, one of which is that ESG readiness for those institutions across that spectrum um, that are answering these questions of sustainability, coming together with corporate growth or organizational growth for the first time. Uh, that means that that has to happen across the organization and often starts with the top. Um, we also understand that there's a lot that needs to happen regarding a roadmap 
um, and planning. And again, that integration of sustainability, ESG into the actual planning. We've also taken on, you know, with the influx of green financing and debt instruments, this is something where Telesto is keenly interested and in. anyone with questions on this too, certainly one of the focuses for today. Um, but I encourage those who are joining us to again, share questions that they have about any of these topics too, that might be relevant, um, you know, for our featured guests today. And then finally, you know, we also realize that this is like any problem, um, there's a data component to all of this and something that, uh, again, uh, we look to aggregate and support an ecosystem. So that's a little bit more about Telesto and happy to share just in terms of the conversation that we are planning and continue to plan and some things to look forward to. Um, we even have our next featured panelist on the call today and I'm excited to share um, you know, we'll be introducing uh, Ayan momentarily, um, but Romy Batia, he is also um, actually participating today and will, um, we was featured at our event in December and certainly has very unique perspective from the vantage of USAID as a senior finance and investment officer. And then Chinua Azubiki will be joining us um, in the months ahead, as well as someone who understands from a blended financing perspective, what are some of those risks on the ground and how are they best mitigated given a local context? So that is some of the things that we have to look forward to. I will hand it over to my colleague, Andrew, who can provide again, um, more of an introduction to the objective for a conversation today, as we again, look forward to kicking off our, our webinar. So I'll pass it over to Andrew. Great. Great. Thanks very much, Alex. Um, sort of digging into the details with you. Um, so very That's quickly, okay. just, just by way of reintroduction again, Ayan, I, I wanted to uh, just read your bio again quickly for the audience, and then we'll get right into the questions here. So Ayan is a, a senior director at Africa Finance Corporation, and she's a CEO of AFC's fully owned subsidiary, Africa Capital Partners. Um, she has over 27 years of experience and a strong track record uh, in emerging markets in particular and investment in those areas, as well as asset management, private equity, infrastructure and climate change related financing products with a particular focus on um, African and Asian markets. And prior to joining AFC, Ayan was also uh, the head and director of the private sector arm of the Green Climate Fund. She played a key role there in building up the mandate of the GFC, uh, GCF private sector facility and rapidly scaling uh, its portfolio. So Ion, welcome. We're really excited to have you here. Um, I'm gonna launch Thank right you, into it given that we just had a little bit of a, the time taken away from us. So I'm gonna get right into the questions. Um, and as we're going through the questions, uh, attendees, if you, if you have any sort of additional thoughts or questions for Ion as we're going through these different topics, please don't hesitate to put them in the chat and uh, we'll try to respond to them as we go through the conversation. Um, but so Ayan, I'll start off by saying so, you know, as a, as a senior director at AFC and CEO of uh, AFC Capital Partners, um, these are pan-African multilateral development finance institutions uh, that focus on sort of closing the financing gap in infrastructure in Africa. Can you tell us a little bit more about the work that AFC does and in particular the work it's doing in the uh, sustainability space? So, what kinds of projects are you all focusing on? What is sort of the ticket size, if you will, of those projects? And what kinds of uh, financial instruments are you using to fund them? So, yeah, um, thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, to just, uh, in the interest of time, to recap, uh, AFC was created uh, almost 16, 17 years ago. Um, and there was uh, a significant amount of gaps that were felt were not being filled. Uh, by, um, um, you know, by, by uh, even some of the very large uh, supranationals, and that is uh, the continent faces a humongous power deficit, um, where we have uh, almost 600 million people that are uh, power starved, so that was uh, absolutely important, and as you know, power, uh, no power means uh, no industrialization means uh, just expensive way of, uh, of operating. So it's not just uh, lighting, but industrialization. Um, Africa is also host to a significant amount of mineral resources. 
uh, ranging from the traditional to uh, increasingly what we call critical metals. And uh, these are metals that are gonna be critical and important for us to, to transition uh, to uh, a greener pasture uh, going forward. And we're talking about lithium, cobalt, um, alumina, anything you need for the solar power panels uh, for uh, storing these uh, 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 renewable energy uh, are really housed in Africa. And, uh, and second, um, and, and, and most importantly, is that there is a significant amount of uh, connectivity, transport, and logistical infrastructure that have not been built. So AFC core investment thesis is that for Africa to uh, basically move ahead, we need to harness our natural resources sustainably uh, using ESG principles, and then we need to move in the first few stages of industrialization. Uh, so that there are jobs created, but also to increase the value capture for African economies. In order to do that, you need two things. You need a very well-developed um, uh, infrastructure in the transport arena. We need uh, a significant amount of um, power that is cheap, that is reliable, and, uh, and most, for the most part, that is green. Um, so, so, so that's what AFC does, is that we don't even build infrastructure for the sake of building infrastructure. We build infrastructure because it enables us to uh, basically develop faster, uh, but also to, um, to, 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 to move uh, this region uh, into um, better value capture and slightly higher GDPs. Uh, to give an example of a project that really speaks to this, uh, in Gabon, what we did is that um, we worked to create an industrial park, which is a net zero park. Um, and in that net zero park, there is a processing. Uh, we had invested in the natural resources, manganese and the forest. And then we basically do process now sustainably uh, FSH certified, one of the first net zero park in Africa. Um, and what it does is that um, uh, it has converted logs that were being shipped, even if they were being shipped sustainably, to the production of um, basically uh, wood products. It started, the bulk of export is still wood veneer, but finished material. Uh, that park has diversified the economy from oil into another resource. And 10% of GDP comes from this new resource. We also build the, uh, the, the, the roads and the ports that are there. So when we look at, for us, sustainability, sustainability really means that we are empowering and we are moving um, not only the, the economic trajectory of our countries, but also we are also building the critical infrastructure to enable that. Uh, like any other region, Africa is uh, facing uh, the, the biggest challenge of our time, which is climate change. And in that context, um, what we have looked at is that we've developed a very strategy that is, is based on the just transition, which looks at Africa as a solution provider to what is happening globally. Uh, today, we are the largest owner of renewable energy in Africa. We have 1.4 gigawatts of wind power. We're adding to that. However, that is focused on uh, the countries that will give us the biggest bang uh, for the buck in carbon reduction. And if you look at the current emission profile of the region, it's around 3.8% or 4% even say. Uh, of the of the of the stock of emission that is out there, and sixty percent of that comes from really two countries, South Africa and Egypt. So our strategy has been to look at the countries that have high emission profile and to support them to move uh, to to transition and to move to greener pasture. Um, and then we need to have a balanced approach for the countries that are very low in 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 their emission profile or negative actually. Um, in the emission profile where the focus is uh, we need to give them the, the sustainable energy and the cheapest source that's available um, in that particular market. We also launched through AFC Capital, the first uh, infrastructure resilience fund, because when people talk about climate, they talk about mitigation, which is extremely important, of course, because it's the warming that is leading us to have different catas catastrophes and different scenarios. So we're also in the meantime, 
trying to construct infrastructure that will, could withstand um, the forces of climate. So the beauty about doing this in Africa is that it's preventive because a huge part of our infrastructure hasn't been built. So if we can design and construct resiliently, what it does is that it increases the longevity, the profitability, it, it lowers the, um, the, 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 the maintenance uh, cost of infrastructure. So our mitigation strategy is to build around four gigawatts of renewable energy in Africa, focusing on the countries where really transition is absolutely critical and important. We are also looking at increasing resilience of this of the infrastructure that we built. We are also um, uh, have put together a strategy around the countries that have transitional metals, where we will imply the same type of policy where we will invest in those natural resources. We will try to process some of it locally and then um, build the infrastructure that they need uh, to trade with the rest of the world. So in a nutshell, that is what AFC is. We have a, a, almost a billion, $11 billion balance sheet. We are an investment grade rated institution um, um, and by Moody's. And we do tap the global capital markets on the debt side, um, but we were on the equity side, it was uh, mostly African capital. So mm -hmm. this, so when it would, the decision was made to um, to establish AFC Capital, the idea was that now to bring further equity and further investment into Africa in the sustainable finance arena. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Diane. So, so that's about AFC. Um, AFC Capital Partners, which I understand, you know, more close to the to the chest for you, um, is much more young. It's sort of come sprouted up in the last two years or so. So what was the motivation for, for creating AFC Capital Partners? What's different about its mission relative to AFC as a whole? So um, um, AFC Capital Partners, absolutely, absolutely as you said, AFC is a, is a, it's, it's a private company um, that is a multilateral. We today have almost 70% of African countries are members of the AFC, and many have contributed also capital to it. Um, but we are public-private partnership at the AFC level, where the, must, the, the bulk of it is large African banks that are shareholders, as well as some African pension funds like PIC, among others. So AFC Capital was created to first look at the sustainability of the, our continent and to mobilize institutional capital at scale using blended structures. So, so that the, was the, cri uh, the critical motivation. And um, as such, when we launch our first uh, climate focused infrastructure fund, um, we looked at what is the pressing need uh, today in the continent? What is the missing link? And um, integration of incremental cost, uh, looking at the recent IPCC report um, and looking at what are the stressors they're causing on the physical infrastructure. So the product was made to support um, adding the resilient layer into how we, are, we, we look at designing and constructing and operating infrastructure, but informed by science, in, informed by the latest APCC report, which has very extensive scenario in looking at what are the new norm that we're living with in terms of level of sea rise, in terms of the significant drought, over flooding in some cases, changes in precipitation, um, in terms of the changes in the wind factors, the number of hurricanes, and we're seeing this all because emissions have no borders. So the same stresses are happening in, in the United States, in Europe, in Asia, and everywhere. So this is a response to say that we're taking um, the, 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 the problem and we are trying to solve it by increasing the resilience of what we do. So I think that was the first product and you will see more products of similar nature to follow. Great. And so you mentioned that a lot of the, the funders of AFC Capital Partners are these big banks and in some cases pension funds. These are institutional investors who sort of operate at a much bigger scale than say perhaps certainly venture capital funds, but also lots of other types of um, investors. What in particular uh, about sort of climate or resilient focused projects uh, is 
well suited to the investment appetite of a of an institutional investor. So I think um, most institutional investors, um, when we look at the institutional investor base, um, we look at um, them in different area. You have an emerging local investor pool, which is the African capital. It's smaller still in comparison to the global pools of capitals that are, are available. Um, but it's still significant and it's becoming more and more important in funding infrastructure. Infrastructure once it's still risk, it's a stable revenue source. It's a source that, uh, that, that pays for itself, uh, even if you integrate resilience measures. So, 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 so that's a class that in general, um, they, um, the uh, asset class is very attracted to. Um, we have not seen much large scale institutional capital from the developed side coming to Africa for at least infrastructure. Even climate, I would say, it's still uh, only the impact investors are active in Africa um, and, um, and a lot of the de development finance institutions. So I think um, for, 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 for us to get the right flow of financing, we need to create de-risk structures that will attract the larger investor pool into Africa, both local and global. So that is the aim, uh, but it's it's still a long way, but we're hoping to 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 travel that. So so tell us just a little bit more about what you what you mean when you say de-risk de financial products for these institutional investors. I mean, what sort of what is the role of AFC Capital Partners in in specifically de-risking? What does this mean on sort of like a project level? to de-risk an infrastructure project in the African context? Okay, so there are multiple layers of de-risking. So let me, let, you know, let me look through that. So the first de-risking, we have done it successfully without significant amount of uh, grant or de-risking that is uh, available. So that is the de-risking of ensuring that these projects reach financial close, uh, they get uh, that they are on budget, they get constructed, and they are able to produce revenue. So when AFC was created, um, what we have is the project development was a key driver in there. So we are able to do that financial, what do you call that, um, revenue de-risking. So we can negotiate this PPA, we fund it with our own equity, and then once it's closer to financial close before construction starts, at times we're able to attract the others because we have politically due risk. We have the right um, um, uh, 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 PPA. We have the right revenue model, if I can say it like that, uh, where investors can say, okay, if I invest in this asset, I know this is the revenue stream, yeah? So that's one due risking. The second due risking that is, uh, at least the foreign investors will look for is that, is that revenue stream gonna give me the right return in my currency, uh, right. currency risk. Um, so in the currency risk um, point, it is, there hasn't been a massive solution that has been found. So um, a lot of people try to negotiate that the PPA have uh, a foreign currency adjustment component so that the IRRs of the investors stay the same. Uh, but that's an evolving area, I would say. It, it's not so much important for the local institutional capital because that's still, their liabilities are in local currency. Uh, so there are certain segments within infrastructure where it's very difficult to structure um, strong or to attract a lot of foreign investors into like road sector because you cannot charge people in dollar terms for their tolls. Right. Uh, power, we have seen a lot of those PPAs have had um, some successes um, in um, pegging a little bit and having inflation adjustment or interest parity adjustment. So, so that's one de-risking. We, we believe we have done that successfully using our own capital. And we do inv invite investors when more capital is needed after we know that there's a revenue coming in. The second part of de-risking on the climate side is, is a very different proposition. That is that for you to construct infrastructure that is resilient, there is a, a little bit higher cost to begin with. Because, because if you are doing a port, that means you have to raise it higher than you would do under business as usual. You will recover that cost, but from a, 
uh, a region that's already starved for capital, it's not that easy uh, to find um, all that. You have to employ um, climate modeling, looking at scenarios as to what would be the climate stressors on that infrastructure. So, so for, for, for that particular um, um, uh, de-risking is where we do tap in the climate funds and the um, others to basically provide what we call incremental cost of making that infrastructure resilient. And, and, and if it's a fund, then that acts as a first loss to attract other investors into that space. So, so, so we can we just need to layer what, what risks we're talking about and who's best to handle it. What can, which ones are really structurally, you need the right government policy, the right framing, the right negotiation and the light closure. There are risks that are more what EPC contractors you're gonna to use to really do your projects on time, on schedule. So, 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 so risk is very broad. So de-risking also could be broad, but I think what's key is we have been able to identify what's that specific risk and what are the mitigation so that we can attract uh, private capital into the projects. Right. So it sounds like, you know, you, you ASC Capital Partners and others are starting to figure out what the blueprint is to tackling these risks. Um, at the same time, though, you, the story you've told is that it, each sort of project has its own sort of unique combinations of risks that require unique combinations of de-risking strategies. Can you just talk a little bit about how you view maybe the scalability of the kind of uh, work that AFC Capital Partners is doing? If, it's, if each project requires sort of the right combination of tweaking of the levers to get a uh, de-risk product um, available, how do you see, what are maybe opportunities to uh, scale this more rapidly? So um, the opportunities are, I mean, for us, from a fund point of view, we look for really kind of aggregating a lot of smaller projects um, that are, you know, for project development, there are a lot of smaller projects. So we, what we like is that we aggregate and then offer scale to institutional investors. Um, that's where you would see the scale up that would happen. So for example, uh, our power uh, platform, which is uh, uh, we acquired Lekela with a number of other partners and we're building on that. So eventually uh, um, you get more money when you have a five gigawatts in Africa, operating assets, dashing up revenue. That's what large scale institutional investors one and, and also diversification of the risks around it and so on and so forth. So, 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 so it's that type of things. What we do is we aggregate um, a number of these smaller projects into portfolios that then could be offered to institutional investors. Okay, that's very helpful to know. Um, would just be curious, I mean, when you're working with smaller groups of smaller uh, investment projects or different smaller entrepreneurs, however you want to characterize, project management teams, let's say, um, something that we, we've heard uh, through sort of our work on the ground, not necessarily at the same level of infrastructure, but just generally in the climate investment space is kind of a certain level of not being investment ready, meaning not being ready to sort of engage with people who are looking to put capital into specific projects. We'd just be curious if this is also something that you've found. I think you're likely maybe operating at slightly larger scale and therefore maybe with more prepared investors, but is that is that a finding you've also found? Um, and if so, I mean, what can be done to enhance the investment readiness of, of these various different project management teams that are out there? So our parent is actually involved from end to end, from, from before small, from blueprint, um, because we do have, as I said, we do develop many of our projects in-house okay. um, where people can come with concept where the investment can range from 1 million, 2 million, 5 million. And then we do half a billion, $1 billion investment. So, so we do the range. Um, for the asset manager, I think what's key is that we are looking at investments that have the potential for scale um, because that's, that's what investors want. Also for um, revenues to, to, to become, come in quickly and to become more predictable. So we try to look at 
the risk structures that can support return returning investor money. Uh, but because we have the climate angle um, on, on adaptation, that hasn't been done as well. Um, it's not a mainstream product today. Uh, so we are hoping to mainstream that, uh, adding resilience to physical infrastructure in Africa. And we have developed our own proprietary models as to how to do that um, and how to basically mainstream that so that it is like green bonds at some point. So it's, it's, it's slightly a new journey, but it's a blended structure that has a first loss and uh, a senior piece. Um, and the senior piece will come from both domestic and global investors. Um, but, but the idea is to really change. We cannot pretend that we are living in a business as usual. We are living in a, in a, in a different scenario today. So we cannot, no matter where you are in this globe, you cannot build, design, and construct the way you did before. Um, and that's a realization that we hope to promote across Africa. Um, and, and it's not just infrastructure, it's every sector. You can do agriculture like you do what, what we were doing before. You can build your houses in certain areas today. So it's just the recognition that we are in probably medium to severe climate scenarios at our current 1.2. Don't even think about what, what would it would be what, if we are 1.5 and that we need to think differently we need to integrate certain risks into our design and in the way we conceive these pipelines. So we're, people, we're in the pipeline development uh, for the most part um, as our parent and, the, and, and because it's a core investment, we, have, we benefit from all that work that uh, AFC already does. Right, makes a lot of sense. Great. Um, I'm going to turn it over to a couple of questions that came from the audience now, just in the interest of time. So um, one of the questions that we got earlier was that uh, for institutional investors, uh, the current the concerns tend to be that climate mitigation and adaptation projects don't necessarily meet the ticket size requirements and often have too much individual project risk. How do you see that being addressed? Um, and do you know of any ex of examples where uh, platforms, maybe in other regions outside of Africa, um, there's port level, portfolio level diversification of these investments. Yeah, I think, um, the, you know, to, to just um, agree with the question, I think um, it's very important for regions, specifically like Africa, um, to look at uh, creation of platforms that aggregate a number of either solar plants or wind, wind plants or um, and create that diversity that institutional investors could come in. But also we believe that in the context of, um, you know, some of the regions, uh, concessional finance is key to create that scale and to de-risk private capital. So, um, so uh, it's just to agree, uh, but it is, um, but you can create that scale in Africa to today. Um, as I said, we already have 1.4 gigawatts. It's an over billion dollar platform. Uh, we are not looking for investors in that platform yet, but once we reach um, three, four gigawatts, it, 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 we, we look, is this something that we can attract investors in it or should we list it? Um, that's an idea. Similarly, in the port sector, there are many uh, operating uh, ports in Africa today. Uh, we have five of them. We are building that out. That could be a platform that's offered to institutional capital longer term. As I said, we also do industrial parks that piggybacky on uh, a very important natural resource. So those could be packaged too if they are net zero um, or net positive in some cases, um, and also packaged to industries to institutional investors. So I think the thinking is starting to happen in Africa. Uh, recognition of the scale requirements and, and and the risk diversification of the portfolios for investors. So you will see players like us and others uh, really going that way going forward. So it is an area that we're very cognizant of uh, and we'll probably do more of. Um, so I think um, 
or, or when we talk about scale, other than very few countries in Africa, you know, for the, most countries, we've got to aggregate. Um, but there are large countries in Africa too. South Africa is large, Egypt is large, Morocco uh, did a big solar plant, in, which was very large to the point that they have access power now. So that exists. But I think in Asia, it's slightly different. You have larger countries um, that can observe um, a huge amount, like they provide the scale within the country. Right. Um, and so, and also if you're chasing carbon, um, um, carbon, you know, uh, 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 mitigation, you, you end up in Asia just because they are emitting much at a much faster pace than anybody else today. So yes, you know, there are regional nuances and differences as we go forward. Right, thank you for that. Um, one last question for the audience and then I think we'll, we'll wrap it up here, which is around uh, the, the story you were telling earlier about the project in Gabon. Um, this audience member asks, how did you integrate the communities into, the, into that particular project? Um, and, in also in terms of access to finance. Yes, I think that's a, 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 a first of all an, a, a very important question. And when we get engaged in most of our projects, uh, we look at uh, almost a three-legged stool. What we call it's our interactions with the government or the host country, interactions with the communities, because we are actually quite active in in the natural resources sector in 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 Africa. Um, and in this case, this was a natural manganese and and uh, and, and the forest. Um, and then you have the investors, ourselves, and others, um, and the partners that that come together to do this. So this project actually it really supported in integrating huge part of the community that were involved in either illegal logging or in um, using some of that really deep. Um, resource for firewood into getting good jobs, um, um, and I really invite everyone to see it's it's the it's the GEZ zone. It's an it's 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 uh, it's it's pretty amazing um, um, industrial park. I think there are many videos online, and really what you have is that high standards housing created, people making good income, good money from that so um and the and the project has 30 percent own local ownership through the to the pension fund and some of the communities so so that's extremely important you can't just ignore one side and others we've seen that in uh many countries in the past where in oil and gas field you'll get oil from a country and then everybody around it is super poor and then you end up investing more money just guarding the field um, as opposed to having really designed something that benefits the, right. the, the, the communities that live around that important resource, which is uh, technically their resource. So it's, 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 it's something that we take consciously. We usually establish some um, also uh, some funds that support uh, hospital development, community development, and, and other areas. So these are areas that we and many of our sponsors actually do that uh, on their own um, without even, we don't have a policing arm, but I think we tend to know that that is what's gonna sustain the project. That's what's gonna lead to uh, a, a longer term um, um, a return on investment by integrating everybody that's around it. Great. Well, Ayan, thank you very much for persisting through the technical difficulties and joining us anyway. Um, it's been a very helpful and enriching discussion as always. Uh, we really thank you for taking the time to do this. And maybe the questions that weren't answered as a result of the technical difficulties, we can save for another webinar if you'll permit us to um, subject you to another attempt to log on to Zoom webinar. So thank you for persisting. Thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Andrew, and apologies for not my problem. not being able to not figure it out, but thank you very much. Thank you, Ayan. Have a good evening. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Thank you, Alex. All right. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next time.